13 states that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We can always depend on him. Always, always, always depend on him. And because we can, his love gets sweeter and sweeter. I was thinking this morning about a hymn that my parents used to sing. He gets sweeter as the years go by. His love is richer, fuller, deeper. Jesus' love is sweeter. Hallelujah. Let's praise the Lord today. Hallelujah.
drink from the cup in your hand lay back against you and breathe feel your heart this love is so deep it's more than i can stand i melt in your peace it's over Hallelujah. We praise and magnify you, Father God. We thank you this morning, Lord, for this wonderful place you've brought us to. Well, welcome to church this morning, everyone. If this is your first time, we want to give you an extra special thanks for coming here this morning. And if you're joining us online today, we thank you for tuning in today. Did Dine and James do a great job this morning? Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Junior youth, you are dismissed. Go ahead and, and take off for your classroom. Why don't you all greet somebody, shake their hand, show the love of God in Jesus' name.
Well, hallelujah. Again, we thank you guys for being here this morning. We praise and thank our Heavenly Father for this great opportunity. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, it's time to continue on with worship. It's time for our tithes and offerings this morning. Uh, if you need an envelope, won't you raise your hand? The ushers will be in the aisle. Uh, they'll hand you out an envelope. We have multiple ways to give here at our finest hour. You can see on the screen there, cash, check, cash app. You can go on the app or go on our website there. Uh, as a reminder, guys, this is your opportunity to put some action to your faith this morning. Amen. That thing you believe in for is right there behind your seed that you plant today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, while you guys are filling out your envelope, um, one other way um, to give is we have our Bible Buck store coming up here really soon. Uh, coming up here in December, and we are now receiving donations for that. Um, if you're not sure what that is, that's for our elementary class. Um, all year long, they've been earning little Bible bucks, um, kind of like uh, church money, uh, for them to spend to buy gifts for you and fa family members. And we're looking for donations uh, to be able to put in that store for them to buy for you guys. Um, you should have got an insert um, in your bulletin today uh, that talks about that, the back of that insert there. Uh, we'll tell you kind of the items we're looking for, give you a general idea of what to bring in. Um, we're going to be receiving those here uh, for the next few weeks before that, that uh, event happens. So look for that amazing opportunity there to, to give again into somebody else's life. I know as a, a dad, of, I had kids in elementary class, and it was always fun to open up on Christmas Day to see what item did they, did they possibly think to buy dad for Christmas uh, that happened to be in the Bible Buck store. So um, it's a fun time. Get, get real creative on the things that you might uh, think and think about the things you might want. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing for dad to get 18 ties. Uh, it's a whole other thing for dad to get a socket set too. Um, he likes those things as well. All right, so uh, uh, be mindful of the things you guys bring in. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, it looks like you guys are all ready to give, so let's hold that up to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for our opportunity, Father God, to bring you our tithes and our offerings. Lord, to lay them at your feet this morning, Father. We thank you, Lord. They are received as a sweet-smelling aroma unto you today, Father Lord. We thank you, Father, that uh, your word is perfect and true, Father God. And you are faithful to perform your word, Father. And right now, Lord, we receive the blessing, Father God, that is due us, Father, for giving into your kingdom today, Lord. And we give you all praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. We've got some awesome things um, in store for today. Uh, we've got a special guest speaker this morning. Uh, Pastor Dan and Jennifer are out of town uh, on their way back right now. They'll be back here shortly. Uh, but for this morning, we have Brother Ben Dodwell. Go ahead, Ben, come on up. He's going to be delivering today's service. And I will quickly turn it over to him. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we also have a special missionary guest with us uh, this morning who's going to share with us for a few minutes. Brother Rufus Wynott and his family were missionaries with Living Water Teaching in Guatemala starting, I think, back in 1984 sometime. And uh, Rufus is a pilot, and he was one of our pilots, but from Guatemala, they went to Berlin, and then they went to Romania, and they're presently in Romania. And he's been going back and forth to Ukraine and dealing with some of the churches there. So we invited him to come and share with us some of the things he's doing this morning. Let's bro welcome Brother Rufus Werner. Thank you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Shall I try that again? <laughs> praise the Lord. Yeah. Hallelujah. It's a good day to praise the Lord. Yeah. Actually, every day is a good day to praise the Lord, no matter how you feel. Amen? Yeah. As Brother Ben mentioned, I was the, uh, actually the first chief pilot for Living Water Teaching. Uh, and I was a the director there for a while. And then God said for us to go back to Germany, to Berlin, where... I received Jesus uh, in 1973, and we started a church in Berlin, traveled in parts of Eastern Europe, and God opened the door for me to travel into Romania six weeks before the revolution. 
And so 10 days after the execution of Ceausescu in the first week of January, I went into Romania with a friend from Sweden, not because of the revolution. We had no clue it was coming, but God obviously did. So he set that trip up in advance and we were among the first foreign ministers to go into the nation. Every church in that country was, now we're talking January, temperatures there are a little bit chilly. Every church in the nation was packed to overflowing, doors and windows open because people were so hungry for the gospel which they couldn't get under the communists. Sad to say, when I went back on my second trip, nine months later, the churches were back mostly to business as usual. They didn't meet the needs of the people. Sort of like America after 9-11, every church was packed. But most leaders weren't prepared to hear from God and to deliver what the people needed to hear. But anyway, 15, 14 trips, on the 14th trip from Berlin, God said, leave the church in Berlin and move to Romania. I said, yes, and I tell people, you don't say, yes, God, but. However, that time I did, I said, God, you had to start a church here, so we cannot leave until you provide a pastor for the church. Anybody here know the name Gary and Gail Cooper? They moved from Frankfurt, Mainz area, to Berlin to take over the church from us so we could move to Romania the first week of January in 95. So we've been there for a little while. Uh, I went in and out of the Ukraine many times, uh, organized some conferences, went and ministered myself before the war. But then when Russia invaded the nation, God said, call some of the leaders there that you know and let them know they are welcome to send any of their people, any refugees that are wanting to leave the war and come to the West, let them know that your foundation has space and we're open and ready to receive. So let me see if we've got some photos here, I think. We'll start with, we'll start with, this is the first group of refugees who came to us from the Odessa area. Three days after the invasion, they came to us we fed them, we gave them a place to rest until they were ready to go on further to the west. Since they came to us, we have had over 200 refugees that we offered housing and food to. Now, never mind my dog on the back of the truck. <laughs> Any, anybody here read that language? That is the world word, children. In the front of that van, there were three adults and a baby. In the back of that closed-in, no-window van, there were 23 children from little to teenagers. 28 hours from Odessa to come to us in the back of that. Now, some people, like Brother Ben just did, shake their head. Others say, oh, no. Oh, yes! You've got to get out of the box, folks. These people made it safely out of a war zone. Uh, you think it's bad in there? It would have been worse if they stayed where they were. They got to us safely. We took a little better care of them then. We used our vehicles, got them to the border, where a Baptist church rented a very nice tourist bus and sent them on to the destination in Germany. See, God has his way, and it's often not the way we think. My first, second, second... Second delivery of helps goods into the Ukraine. The man on the left is Pastor Jan. And you can see they could use everything from toilet paper, medicine, and in the box outside of my stomach is an inverter generator to provide electricity. When the electricity is down in some places, it's often down because of the war. Do nice Dodge, what do we call that? I've been out of mirror, is that SUV? Anyway, our partners provided the money to buy that vehicle for Pastor Jan to serve his area, Ishmael, and he goes other parts of the nation, including through the red zone, and I'll mention that later. Next one. My first trip into Mykolaiv. Mykolaiv is a city that was close enough to Kyrgyzstan, close enough to the act of war to receive missiles, on a regular basis. 
Now, some of the refugees that were staying with us long term knew I go into the nation once or twice every month. Man, they never said a thing about that until they heard I was going to Mikolaev. And one of my refugees is from there because his place got totally destroyed by a missile. And they all came to me and said, no, 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 Pastor, it's too dangerous to go there. My response was, it's too dangerous for me not to go there. When God said go, if I stay here, I'm in more danger than going there. Uh, I was only there for one night. Uh, next, the next morning, did an evangelistic message here, and 24 people prayed to receive Jesus. But the night I was there, there was not a single siren. There was not a single missile fi fired at that city. It, almost every day or night, they were getting fired at. The next day at 2, we left. That night, after we were gone, there were five attacks against the city. So hear God's voice and obey. Don't add to, but do what he says to do. He takes care of you. He didn't send me there to die. I flew uh, Cobras in Vietnam. I don't say I celebrated, but I had my 21st birthday in Vietnam. I come from Canada. I came south to take the place of the thousands of non-heroes who went north, but that's another story. I never had a plan. I've already had my war zone. I never had a plan to go into another war zone, ever. But how many know that God has a sense of humor? Anybody know that? How many realize his sense of humor is warped? I, I have been since March last year, I have been in the Ukraine an average of one point whatever times every month, including into the red zone where is still active fighting going on. But God, hear his voice. And what's the old song? Hear and obey, hear and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to hear and obey. That's for big kids not just for little kids, hear and obey. Next one. Uh, this is in Ishmael, a couple of months later, 29 people prayed to receive Jesus in this morning meeting. Same church on the outside, uh, just six weeks ago when we were there, nicer weather, uh, and here, I think 14 prayed to receive Jesus. My first few trips was just taking helps goods, but now I don't go unless I've organized with the pastors who are going to receive me. We're going to do outreach. It's about souls, folks. It's not about the stuff. They need the stuff, but they need long-term as an eternal relationship with Jesus, and that's what we're about. Uh, here's a site you don't see on the roads here too much near the big towns and outside the cities, in the safe zone, away from the war area, you'll see these trucks parked everywhere, uh, on the road, off the road, in the fields, because the invaders, where they have been, they take everything of value and not so valuable and send it back to Mother Russia. So all the owners of the vehicles have sent their vehicles out to the safe areas closer to the Romanian, Moldovan, Hungarian, or Polish border. And on that, this is near a town, but when you're outside a town, these trucks, every time they come to a railway crossing or a construction area, you can have a backup of anywhere from a couple hundred yards to two miles of trucks. Now, I don't have time to sit behind trucks going at zero speed. So I've learned how to play chicken. <laughs> on the roads where you don't have trucks on both sides, just on the side that you're driving. So you get in two-lane road, you get in the left lane, and you just go as fast as you can until you see somebody coming the other way. And then you look for a hole where the trucks are or grass, hopefully, safe area on the left, pull over, let them by, and then you hit it again. Have nothing, no idea about the legality, but that's how I, I don't, I, hey, God, keep your angels busy. I talked about the red, zone, the red line. There is a, what they do call it the red line, and that is an area, if you're to the 
west or the south of the red line, you're in a somewhat safe area. Not totally safe because the Russians are still sending in missiles and rockets every day against the main cities, big towns, and even small places where there are ships able to dock, load up the grain, and take it to the west. Every day they're attacking. Uh, but across the red zone, you can't even get into the red zone unless you're accompanied by somebody with a special military pass because every road has guards on it to prevent war tourism, I guess you want to call it. But this is delivery of another generator. Uh, I think that's number eight or nine of 17 generators we've given away so far. And this lady is the mayor of this village, which had been attacked and occupied and 60, 70% destroyed by the Russians. Now, they're not there. They left before I got there. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have got there. Another village near the first one, and you see the stoves back there? We have a contact who makes these metal stoves. We provide the money, and on this trip, I think we provide the money for 25 stoves for heating and cooking on. This, at that village, I was close enough to hear rockets or missiles, I'm not sure which, I didn't want to go see, exploding, six miles, the wind blowing in the right direction, you could hear the explosions from the Russians, Russians shelling that next big town. This sign says, danger, minefield. There's hundreds of thousands of mines that the Russians, as they have left areas, they've left these mines behind. Very, very dangerous. Farmers still, every once in a while, you hear of them getting blown up as they're just trying to take care of their, their fields. Yes, Virginia, the bear does go over the mountain. Three, three trips ago, this is still in Romania, going over the east side of the Carpathian Mountains. Going up over the mountain, there's mama and two babies. Next shot. Three days later, coming back, there's Papa Bear on the other side of the road, just sitting there watching the cars go by. I don't know if you encounter things like this on your way to ministry, but hey, life is not boring. Next. Uh, this is on my, our property in Transylvania, and each summer we have a camp for children. 74 children, 24 workers. The majority of these children at the camp were Roma, or you would say gypsy children from different communities. That was July of this year. Next one. Uh, at the Roma camp next to the city dump, we've been ministering in this camp for 29 years, and this is our little kids group, uh, shots from a boat, no, not from a boat. It's from either this morning or last Thursday. I can't remember which. Next one. The big kids. This is from three weeks ago at Paterit. 620 people live in that gypsy camp. I would say 65 to 70% of them have prayed to receive Jesus with us in the last 28 years. Ah, I'm sorry. This is... A little bit out of water, I miss this one. This is my first visit into, make a delivery into the Ukraine back in March last year. Okay, is that it? That's enough. Uh, one thing I want to mention though is I, I didn't have, couldn't find the picture of water baptism. Six weeks ago, I baptized a lady who is 60 and a teenager girl. The son of the older lady and the father of the teenage girl came, and along many others came to see the baptism. I gave an explanation of what baptism really means, including, doesn't mean nothing without salvation. The son of the older lady, the father of the girl being baptized, both received Jesus that day. It's... We do lots of stuff, but the bottom line is souls. Thank you for praying for us.
I won't tell pilot stories on Rufus. <laughs> Embarrassing, but uh, he flies like he drives, apparently, so. <laughs> I, ex I experienced a few of those things, yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your great love and grace that you have given to us. <clears throat> thank you for Brother Rufus and Dee, and thank you for your hand of grace and protection upon them and all that they're doing. We thank you for that and their faithfulness in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> My uh, message this morning has to do with our calling and, you know, our, our motive for coming to Christ is really a big deal. Uh, Jesus suffered all he did to pay for something. And, you know, we, we kind of see Jesus on the cross to pay for our sins and deliver us from the penalty of that sin. And, of course, that's true. Uh, but what we often don't see is he sacrificed himself to redeem mankind from Satan's power and nature and restore man to fellowship with God and God's nature. We must understand that the way you and I were born into this world is not the way God originally created man. I shared some of this on a Wednesday night a few weeks ago, so it, some of this bears repeating, but you have to set that foundation uh, very solidly to understand what Christ has done for us. In Genesis 1.26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. In verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them, male and female, he created them. So what is the image of God? He's not talking about physical likeness. He's talking about his nature, which is love. Uh, in Genesis 2.17, God told Adam and Eve that if they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would surely die. But we know they didn't die physically. So what died? God's nature that they were created to have is what died. And they were separated from God's love. Because of their sin, they now had, because of the deception of Satan and their disobedience and their sin, they now have Satan's nature. And that's the nature that you and I inherited when we were born into this world. A lot of people are confused about that. You know, we have various uh, aspects of our life and our emotions and all of those things, and we think, you know, how could a loving God uh, do this? We need to understand that the way you and I were born, we were born as descendants of Adam with Adam's nature, which was really the devil's nature that he inherited when he took it. And we have to know that. You have to go back to the beginning. <laughs> you can't start in the middle. You have to go back to the beginning and understand what took place here. When we come to an altar and pray the sinner's prayer, for example, to be saved, it's not so I can incorporate Jesus into my old life. Adam's nature, so he can make it better. You know, we have this idea sometimes that we receive Christ and we incorporate him into our life as it is, hoping and believing that he will make that better. Adam's fallen nature, the carnal mind, Paul calls it the carnal mind, and the spirit of God are totally incompatible. The carnal mind that you and I were born with <clears throat> and the Spirit of God are totally incompatible. Romans 8, verse 7. Paul said, The carnal mind is enmity, not enemy, 
enmity against the Spirit of God, for it is not subject to the law of God. And then he emphasizes, he said, neither indeed can it be. <coughs> Excuse me. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Enmity means a state of being actively opposed to or hostile to someone or something. So the carnal mind, the carnal nature, Satan's nature, the Adam's nature that we were born with, is totally opposed to and hostile to the Spirit of God. These two are not compatible. So the point I'm making is we can't, we can't receive Jesus into the old man and try to improve the old man. There has to be a separation here. Don't reduce your understanding of, of salvation, of your Christian experience, to just being forgiven of your sins so you can go to heaven when you die. You know, this is... This is all true, of course, but we tend to emphasize that. Don't reduce it to thinking, now I'm a child of God, so Jesus can help me make my Adamic nature, my sinful nature better, and my circumstances better. This is where a lot of people are. He sacrificed himself to deliver me from that old Adamic nature and restore me to fellowship with my Father, and restore God's nature in me. It's not just about forgiving sins. It's about restoring God's nature in me, restoring me back to what God originally created man to be. Jesus does help us, of course, but our focus often tends to be on what we are needing and wanting from him instead of learning to be like him. We often don't see the need for the drastic disconnect between that old life and the new life. What it requires is a drastic disconnecting from, from that old life, not a, not a merging of these two uh, situations. Second Corinthians 5.17, very familiar verse. It says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. That's the new man. Let's make sure we're stepping into what he intended us to become, a new creation, so we can learn to follow Jesus. We tend to let natural things, the circumstances of life, uh, become our reality. The life we're living, or the li or that we lived in the past, often remains a higher truth than the life we're called to. Let me say that again: the life we are living, or particularly lived in the past often remains a higher truth than the life Jesus has called us to. Our memories can carry more weight than our pursuit of Jesus. We identify more with the way life has been than, we, than who we be, have become in Christ. Are we needing him or are we following him? Our identity we identify more by the way life has been than who we have called to become in Christ. So what's our motivation? Are we just wanting him to do something for us? Or are we surrendered, sold out, pilgrims passing through this world, seeking a homeland, following him? Those are all scriptural entreaties. Jesus said, the things I do, you will do also if you believe. And even greater things than you will you do because I go to my Father. I've said this before, are we just doing church or are we being the church? 
2 Timothy 3, 5, Paul told Timothy that these people would, certain people would have a form, and people in the last days would have a form of godliness, but de denying its power. Martin Luther said, preach and live as if Jesus was crucified yesterday, rose from the dead today, and is returning tomorrow. That's a good mindset to have. Jesus did not come to make bad men good. He came to make dead men live. The lost, no matter how good and kind they are, are the walking dead. Jesus said, go and preach this gospel. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Those who do not believe are condemned already. It doesn't, you know, you can line up 10 people. You can go out on the street and line up 10 people and ask them if they're going to go to heaven, and they'll tell you yes. And when you ask them why, they say, because I'm a good person. I'm a nice person. <laughs> There's no scriptural basis for that. You can be a nice person and split hell wide open. This is, this is what's going to happen. This is, it's, it's a grand deception, and most people tend to think that way. <clears throat> Has his truth really made us free from that old life that we brought to the altar when we prayed that sinner's prayer? The paradox is that the only way you can truly live is to die, to deny yourself. John 12, 24 to 26, most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. This is Jesus talking. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. The problem is often that we don't readily deny ourselves, and self is very much alive. The old Adamic nature, the carnal mind, frankly, is a very difficult thing to overcome because it comes naturally to us. We don't have, you know, you don't have to teach children uh, to be selfish. Just put one toy in a room with two toddlers and they, they've got it figured out already. It's, it's going to happen. These things come naturally to us. Charles Spurgeon said, everywhere there is apathy. Nobody cares whether that which is preached is true or false. A sermon is a sermon, whatever the subject, only the shorter it is, the better. A lot of people think that way. Charles Spurgeon actually died 131 years ago, so you can see the contemporary American Christian culture is not a new problem. What would happen if when we are born again, we think and act as if the previous life no longer exists. What would happen if when we get born again, we pray that sinner's prayer, we think and act as if that previous life no longer exists? We don't because we often don't have intimacy with the Father. We feel like God is way off somewhere in heaven. And an intimate relationship with the Father is built only by filling your mind with his word and time in prayer. That's one of the biggest problems in the American churches is the lack of time that people spend in the word because we have so many distractions uh, in our culture. If I spend more time on Facebook and Instagram and whatever it is than I do in the word and prayer, I'm feeding the old man, not the new creation. 
instead of growing in faith and love, I'm going to grow in doubt and unbelief. 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you. A lot of people can't even explain that. We're accustomed to getting all of our answers and direction from the world. You can't get your answers from the world if you're a Christian. Your answers are in the scripture. Your guidance is in the scripture, not in the world. The world is full of deception. And what we're, you know, what's going on around us now is just getting worse and worse all the time. <clears throat> they introduce new ideas and new words that seem to have certain meanings, but really don't, don't have any meaning. You, you know, it's called diverting. If you try to confront people with what they're talking about, they'll, they'll def deflect it. Go on YouTube or something and watch these um, um, Washington, watch these uh, committee meetings <laughs> where they're interviewing people. You can lose your salvation in about five minutes watching that that for a while. But listen, this is, this is what we're dealing with. And this is what's going on. The only way you can overcome that is to know the truth. Because if you don't know the truth, these people will, will talk in a way that seems right, you know. Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. We need to think with the mind of Christ, not the mind of men, the carnal mind. <clears throat> First John 2, 3 through 6. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Strong words. But whoever keeps his word... Truly, the love of God is perfected in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Most people would say that's really impossible to walk as he walked. I can't see myself doing that. But the Bible says that's exactly what we Christians have been redeemed for, is to walk as he walked. 1 John 3.22, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit to put his life into our mortal bodies to enable us to walk as he walked. We have two things going on. We have, you know, your, your, biggest, your biggest challenge is your own mind. <laughs> it's the carnal mind. That's the biggest challenge. And you know, in Romans 7 and 8, Paul talks about this. And we have to decide, are we going, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who walk according to the spirit, not according to the flesh. We have, we basically have two people living in us at the present time, and we have to decide which one we're going to feed and encourage and strengthen and think by and live by. And if we don't do that, by default, we're just going to slip into the old carnal man. Romans 8.11, But the, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Your mind is part of your mortal body. It can be renewed by the word. So here's the problem. We come to Jesus very often for reasons other than why he called us to himself. We come for provision. We come for safety. 
We come hoping he provides the things we care about. We come to him when everything is falling apart, hoping he will put it back together. We come to him when we break something, hoping he fixes it. Most of the time, we come to him for us, not for him. It's very hard for us to see past ourselves. And you know, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about myself as well. All of this comes out of my own experience. We can put on the theology of Christ instead of the body of Christ. We can develop a gospel that serves us rather than changes us. This is what has happened in America. This is what is happening in evangelicalism in America today. We've put on, we've presented for years a gospel that serves us, doesn't talk about changing us. We got the idea that you can pray the sinner's prayer and my sins are all forgiven and when I die I'm going to heaven, but nothing else particularly is required of me. I can keep going on living the way I was. You'll never live the life Jesus paid for unless you come to him for him. All you do is be consumed with what you need for your life and bring him into your life hoping he will make, happen to make things better. It's actually a very boring, self-centered life to come to Jesus only for what he can do for you. And that's what happens with a lot of people. Instead of being born again, we're bored again. Churches are full of people who are bored with their Christianity. If that's where you are, something is very wrong. You've missed something key somewhere. <clears throat> You're always going to be driven by your circumstances. You're always hoping things will go the way you want them to be. Your whole prayer life tends to revolve around you. It's what I want, when I want it, how I want it. <clears throat> it's living in a self-conscious, self-centered world that's subject to falling apart when anything changes. And when our self-centered prayers are not answered, we start to think, what's wrong with me? Where's God? What am I doing wrong? How can I get more faith? How do I need to pray differently? I'm not making this stuff. We deal with this stuff every day. <laughs> God does want to help you and bless you. No question about it. But our Christian life often becomes about getting something and leaves out becoming something what he wants us to be. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do many wonderful things in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. You who work lawlessness. <clears throat> when we're born again, we actually enter into a covenant with God. And a covenant is between two parties and both parties have responsibilities. I heard somebody say, don't read the Bible to memorize it, read it to become it. There are lots of people who can quote the word and they're mean, they're angry, they're nasty, they're unforgiving. The reality is it's possible to quote the word and really not know God. Don't let Sunday morning be your Christianity. You can't let your church attendance take the place of knowing him and becoming like him. We're starting to see a theme here recurring. The goal is transformation. The goal is change. 
Don't let Sunday morning be your Christianity. That's a grand deception. Don't let your church attendance take the place of knowing him and trying to become like him. The scripture says we've gathered here to worship God and to stir one another to love and good works, to live outward to others. How do you know that, Brother Ben? It says it in Hebrews 10, 24, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. There it is. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Beloved, the day is approaching fast. The term Christian means Christ-like. So Christianity really is about becoming like Christ. I want to read Matthew 25, 31 to 46. got this up. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from the other as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. We just watched a whole lot of this in Rufus's story. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer and say to him, Lord, when did, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it <clears throat> to me. The only difference between the sheep and the goat, the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25 is one group lived beyond themselves and recognized the needs of others. The other group didn't even recognize that there was a need. What would happen if we got up every morning deciding to be more like him? That's usually not my first thought in the morning. <laughs> What would happen if we got ever up every morning deciding to be more like him? What if we got up in the morning and decided nobody owes me a thing? What if I found my identity, my purpose, my reason for being in serving the Lord Jesus Christ? What if I didn't need your love and acceptance because I'm in union with God, and he loves and accepts me. Every situation you're in is a situation in which you can reveal Jesus. I'm talking about witnessing now. We get prayer requests all the time for people who want us to pray that they get a new job because I'm the only Christian there. 
they're unhappy because they're surrounded by people who are not like them. They're not Christians. And we tell them, we're not praying that. You're there because you are the Christian that God put there. Your responsibility is to show Jesus to these people. You be a witness. We also get prayer requests too, similar to that. I want a new boss. Same problem. My boss is not a Christian, blah, 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 everything. I need a new boss. Well, we're not going to pray that. You know what Jesus would have done? He would have invited your boss to lunch. Zacchaeus, for example. Zacchaeus, come down. I must come to your house today. We're going to have lunch together. But we're praying. I don't want to, I'm the only Christian there. I hate it. I need a new boss. See, it's, it's all about us. We don't, we don't have this perception that we're there to be a representation. Pastor Jerry used to say, when you get your bucket pump, what splashes out is what you're full of. When we get our bucket bumped, sometimes everything but Jesus splashes out. I've been guilty of that many times. Jesus is not here to serve us. He came to father us and transform us from being the descendants of Adam to being the children of God. 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What does it mean to walk in the light as he is in the light? Well, it definitely does not mean complaining, bickering, backbiting, frustration, unforgiveness, discouragement. Those are all the old man. Those are the carnal mind. That's, that's Adam's nature. But those are the things we got tricked into believing were normal because we were born into it. And it, comes so, it just comes naturally to us. But we got born again and were supposed to put off the old man and put on the new. Colossians 3.12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word and deed, do, all that, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father. Where do we read something like that and don't get the idea that we're supposed to change and do that? How does that, how does that get past us? New wine should be going into new wineskins. New wine does not get contained in the old way. The goal here is transformation. We need to realize I was never created for me. I was made for God in his image. Here's what happened. Every one of us, when we were born as descendants of Adam, I've mentioned that several times, but here's what happened when, when you're a descendant of Adam. You have no godly identity initially. I'm not talking about before you're born again. You have no godly identity. You need love. You need support. You need stability. You need recognition. 
You need to be appreciated. You need to be valued. And you need to be accepted. I need, I need, I need. Why? Because when Adam sinned, we were cut off from God's nature, God's love. Having been separated from God, man now has all these psychological needs, and most of us didn't get half of what was on that list in an effective way. And that's why so many of our, our lives are dysfunctional in various ways. Uh, many of us didn't get half of what was on that list in an effective way. I grew up in a crazy, alcoholic, mental illness family. Seven children in my mother's family, five of them were alcoholics and mentally ill. Five of them died from that. I became an alcoholic. This is, I'm not going to go into this testimony now, but I was an alcoholic. Total craziness. At a young age, you and I basically became nothing more than how we responded to what we got or didn't get, and that became your identity. What I l grew up with and lived with became my identity. And I tell you, it was crazy. It was, it was dark and it was crazy. How we responded to what we got or didn't get became I, our identity. That's why your story matters so much. That's why people talk about themselves all the time, because it's the only place they found any sense of identity, good or bad. They know their own story, and they want to tell you about it. You know, I've been working with uh, people recovering from alcohol and drug addiction for over 40 years. What I'm talking about is the root of all addictions. We have no idea who we really are, so we live up to the low level, the low self-esteem in which we see ourselves. Everybody who is dealing with addictions of various kinds have low self-esteem. It's chronic with everyone. Drugs and alcohol give a temporary, counterfeit sense of security and well-being. Temporary, counterfeit sense of security and well-being. But you know, if you don't know what the answer is, if you don't know God, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know there is a new man that you can become, you keep going back to that all the time because it's the only answer that works for you. So the only long-term success is getting people born again, spirit-filled, getting their minds renewed with the Word of God. That's the only hope for long-term recovery. Everyone, we want everybody to like us and accept us. And here's Jesus saying, I love you. I accept you. Come out of the darkness into the light. God breathes into Adam, and Adam becomes a living being, and he's filled with God's nature, love. The Bible says God's nature is love. Everything God does is motivated and flows from love. <clears throat> I know I'm repeating some of this, but faith comes by hearing. We need to hear some of these things over and over again because to a large part we're living in a different way. So why did we grow up needing love, looking for love in all the wrong places, being needs-driven? We already said it, because when Adam sinned, he got separated from God. When you're separated from God, nothing works. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. They didn't die physically. What, they, what died was God's nature. Instead of Adam being love, he became in need of love and acceptance and support and stability. This is where people in the world are today. I'm sorry to say a lot of people in the church are the same, in the same position because they don't understand what we're talking about. Jesus came to take care of that problem. 
because sin had a, in effect evicted God from his home and man. Jesus took away the sin of the world. Why? So we could just pray the sinner's prayer so we would go to heaven someday when we die? No. No, so we could get restored back to God and God's nature and walk in the light as he is in the light, as Paul said, walking in a manner that is like him. The cross is not only about the forgiveness of sins, but the restoration of man back to the purposes of God and God's nature. We readily see Jesus and are told about Jesus as the forgiver of our sins and the way to heaven, and of course he is. But Jesus said he was the way back to the Father. Now, not when we die. There's some people that teach even that you, you, you be saved when you die. Read the Bible for crying out loud and find out what you're talking about. It's not that we're wrong, it's that our focus usually is more on something that serves us instead of changes us. We can be disgruntled, discouraged, complaining, mad, frustrated, and have no sense of conviction about it at all. Philippians 2.14, do all things without complaining and disputing. We should start every staff meeting with that scripture. <laughs> Put it on the wall or something. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. We're not Christians for us. We're Christians for him and for the sake of others. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live, here it is, should no longer live for themselves, but live for him who died for them and rose again, should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. If you are not a Christian for him and the sake of others, you're not really going to be happy and fulfilled in your Christian life. <clears throat> you're going to be one of the bored again. <clears throat> You're just living day by day, and your circumstances <coughs> will have a louder voice than the gospel. Excuse me. How you are will often be defined by your circumstances, not by who you are in Christ. If you ask a lot of Christians how they are, they will tell you all their troubles in great detail. They don't tell you their victory. They don't tell you they're grateful. They don't tell you they're in the world, but not of it. They don't tell you how, how in love they are with Jesus. They will tell you about their aches and pains. They're afraid they might be laid off next week. My spouse has really been acting crazy, and please keep me in prayer, brother. That's what you get. I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean or judgmental. I'm trying to be real. These are things we deal with every day. Jesus paid an incredible price to put his life back inside of me, and he said, I'm going, if I'm going to follow him, I have to deny myself. Not just pray the sinner's prayer and not change anything else but take up my cross and follow him. The Lord's goal for Christians, the little Christ-like ones, is to spread out all over the earth, preach this gospel to every creature, and shine before the lost. The lost should want what we have. If I'm no different than them, why would they want what I have? Very often, people are just demonstrating religion to them. 
I, I get people, well, I get people in uh, recovery, uh, recovery ministry all the time that will tell me about all the condemnation they received from religious experience and how they don't want anything to do with God because they were presented a God who didn't love them, who required all kinds of things that they couldn't live up to. That's not biblical Christianity. Matthew 5.16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The unsaved of the world should get drawn to us because we're, shining, we're a shining light and they should see the difference between you and them and want what you have. I'm going to insert a little military analogy here about transformation. You know, in, in 1964, I got a letter from Uncle Sam that said, Greetings. I need your help. And so I was inducted into the military. And, you know, we took a physical, you know, in those days, you know the little mirror the dentist has, the little round mirror? They put that under your nose. If it fogged up, you were okay. I took it. <laughs> but, you know, I took, we stood in a room, we raised our right hand, and we took an oath of allegiance to the United States to the United States military to defend the Constitution of the United States, even if it cost you your life. Was I a soldier at that point? Far from it. I was in every way legally a member of the military. I was a member of the United States Army. I, everything involved with that, they owned me. And everything involved with that was mine, but I wasn't a soldier. I just took this oath. But you know, they have a discipleship program. <laughs> they don't call it discipleship. They call it basic training. And for the next 16 weeks or more, they are going to change the way you think, the way you look, the way you react, they're going to make you a new creation according to their image. We have the same thing in the church. That's what we should be doing here. That sinner's prayer is like taking that oath of allegiance when you're inducted into the military. But all that does is get you in. You're now a member in every way. If you pray that prayer sincerely, you are now a member of the kingdom of God in every way. But you're not a disciple yet. So we have, we have a basic training program too. It's called Ephesians 4.11. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the perfecting of the saints. For what? For the work of the ministry. The army perfected me to be a soldier, and then they handed me a weapon and said, go do it. In Ephesians 4.11, we're to be perfected, trained, grow in every way, changed, perfected. And to what? The work of the ministry. There's something to do with all this knowledge and all this new creation that you've become, there's something we're supposed to be doing with that. Transformation is about thinking and acting like we never did before. Born again should mean the old man is dead. And I can tell you, you know, the Army does such a great job at their discipleship program that it often takes people a lot of time to readjust to civilian life after you've thought and acted that way for so long. Hopefully, that happens with us here, stirring each other up to love and good works, as we talked about earlier. You know, 90% of all counseling pastors do 
is about people struggling with other people. 90% of it is about people relationships. How much we're struggling with other people is a good barometer for showing that we don't really have a revelation of why Jesus came or what he wants us to become. We still think it's all about us and how we feel and what they did to us. We're letting other things matter way more than what matters most. We're letting circumstances speak louder than truth. When we see Jesus in the Gospels, he's modeling for us the life that Adam lost. John 14, 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If we're justifying the old nature, and you have all these reasons why you're living the way you're living, and it's not Christ, you need to get rid of those alibis. The mercy and forgiveness of God is not a license to stay the same. It should actually be a motivation to change. In America, in recent years, we have preached a gospel of what I can only call cheap grace. We emphasized grace. Grace is, of course, true and it's very important. But we have emphasized grace in a way that doesn't require change. People just go on living like they were living. They go on sinning, and in their mind, they're living a life in sin and doing something, and in their mind they think, well, God has forgiven me, I'm, I'm under grace. You're deceived. You can't let another person and how they may have treated you determine who you are if Jesus is your Lord. One, you can only emotionally abuse a person who does not know who they are. In our fallen Adamic nature that we're born with, we have a mentality, a mindset that's totally opposite from that of Jesus, and to us it feels normal. There's the problem. We have to work on that. I've got to fill my mind with the Word of God. I've got to be intimate with God. I've got to have an intimate relationship with God through Christ and prayer, and not neglecting the gathering of ourselves together. If we prayed the sinner's prayer and we're born again, but keep living and thinking like Adam, we're actually living a lie in reality. You can't pray the sinner's prayer and stay selfish and fight with your spouse. Jesus wants us to walk in love, show mercy, and make peace. Not easy. Being angry, frustrated, and driven is certainly not the nature of God. If you have animosity in your heart for a loved one and you feel uncomfortable about that, don't feel uncomfortable. Be changed. Go and reconcile that situation. And if you're sitting here and you're elbowing your spouse by what I'm saying, what you're saying is that if you would change, then I would be okay. You know, this is a, this is a true story. I, I know this story from experience. This woman had a husband who was alcoholic and was a real problem, and she prayed for him for 10 years. Prayed for him for 10 years. Every day for 10 years. Eventually, he came to the end of himself and he went to Alcoholics Anonymous and he got sober. Basically, you know, on his own. He decided, I can't keep living this way, and so forth. And she was mad, and she went to God, you know, in prayer, and she said, 
I have been praying for him for 10 years and nothing happened. You didn't answer my prayer. And God said, well, I couldn't answer your prayer because you were not praying in love. I could not answer your prayer because you prayed in hate, not love. 1 John 4, 7 through 11. Beloved, let us love one another for God, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Do you know that God does not want you to hold on to any of the old man? Do you understand that when you came to Jesus, it wasn't for there to be some of you and some of Jesus? I talked earlier about this drastic disconnect from the old life to the new life. Your perspective while you're here on earth is everything. If you're not eternally focused and kingdom-minded, you're not Christ-centered and Christ-minded, and you will be carnally-minded and behave like mere men, Paul told the Corinthians. You're behaving like real men, mere men. I have to be heavenly-minded so I can be earthly incredible. This is the one time divorce is allowed, I think. Divorce, divorce yourself from the world and join into union with Christ, well, you can't really live the Christian life. The intention is that you cut ties with the world in the sense that it has been your master. Jesus didn't just pay a price to get me to heaven. He paid a price to get hell out of me. Romans 12, 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Colossians 1.21, and you who once were alienated and, I love this, enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. John Stott was an English uh, Anglican priest. He said, we should not ask what is wrong with the world, for that diagnosis has already been given. Rather, we should ask, what happened to the salt and light? Dinah and James, you want to make your way back up. Ephesians, I'm, I'm, this is my first closing, I think. <laughs> if you've been around any length of time at church, you know there are multiple closings. When a pastor says, I'm closing, don't. Don't pay any attention to that. Or if he takes his watch off and puts it up here on the, on the lectern, don't pay any attention to that. It means nothing. <laughs> Ephesians 4.1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, 
endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And so everybody has a calling. We are called to suffer even when we do good and take it patiently. And most importantly, all of us have a calling to maintain and stay in truth in the midst of unfairness and perversity all around us. And boy, that's a statement for our culture today. We have a calling to maintain and stay in truth in the midst of unfairness and perversity all around us. Um, I want to, uh, there, have been, there have been a lot of folks who have been, who have been sick. We've been dealing with uh, many of our members who are sick. And uh, if you're sick today, I would like to uh, pray for you. You know, James 5.14 says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. The New Living Testament renders it this way. Any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed sins, you will be forgiven. And you know, in Mark, the, in Mark 16, 18, the Great Commission verse, it is said that the disciples, the Christians, will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And I want to, in a minute, I'm going to invite you, if you want prayer uh, for sickness, to be healed. Uh, I want to instruct you about that a little bit. Uh, very often, people come in a prayer line, and they think it's a counseling session, and they want to tell you all about, well, this started in 1945, and I've had, I've had all these operations and this and that. Prayer line is not a counseling session. God, I don't need to know what is wrong with you because here's a big revelation. I'm not the healer. Pastor Dan is not the healer. We are disciples who were told to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's what we're doing. We're not praying the prayer of I hope so. We're praying the prayer of faith. And so very often people think, you know, they get their hands laid on them and nothing seems to happen. And that is dangerous for both the person who's praying and the person who was prayed for because they start to get all kinds of ideas. They start to think, well, I guess God didn't heal me because I didn't feel something. I think God didn't heal me because nothing changed when they prayed for me. I still have that pain in my shoulder. You are setting your faith on feelings. You're setting, instead of setting your faith on the word. If your faith is in me or Pastor Dan, it's misplaced. Your faith should be in God and in the word. And you know, I could tell you many stories. I'm not going to take the time now, but I could tell you many stories of people. I, in fact, I just heard one this past week where a woman brought a child who was little, where a woman brought a younger than a year old and that child was having seizures and doing this, and the child's eyes were going in all directions. And, Pastor, please pray for my...
the child is still going through the seizures, her eyes are going all over the place, making no noises. And, you know, you start to think, did I do something wrong? Is my faith? No, it isn't any of that. And he said, you know, I found out that three days later, the mother called and said the child was perfectly all right. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So if, if you don't come in a prayer line and think if something didn't manifest, for, thank God when it manifests instantly and it often does. But if it doesn't, don't go away thinking nothing happened. Don't go away and don't develop a doctrine that says, well, God heals some people and he don't heal others. That's where that nonsense comes from. It comes from people setting their faith on their feelings and the manifestation of things instead of on the word of God. Lay your hands upon the sick and they shall recover. If it doesn't happen right away, keep your mouth shut and thank God. God that you are recovering okay and so if you would like prayer for sickness for healing please come up and we will do what we just said
Well, praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Ben. Hallelujah. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for such a wonderful service. Let's all go ahead and stand this morning. I got a few quick announcements for you. We'll get you out of the way here. Um, our Abundant Rain food drive that we've partnered with Abundant Rain uh, is coming quickly to a close. The very last day to bring in items, the turkeys, the cakes, the stuffing, all that will be um, this coming Wednesday. Um, also, if you don't have a chance to go shopping for that, if you just want to give money, you can give money towards that. I think Miss Laura is going to be going out um, this week to go shopping for that. And uh, that distribution is going to happen this coming Saturday. So uh, Wednesday will be the very last day to bring any of that stuff in. Um, connect groups. We have lots of connect groups, lots of things happening next Sunday. Um, if you have not signed up to attend uh, your connect group's holiday party, uh, we encourage you to go out there today, right after service, the Oasis Cafe. Sign up for your respective group. That way we can get an accurate head count of who all is going to be coming. Uh, that includes the Empower, the Impact, and the Destiny. We all have something going on um, next Sunday. Uh, as a reminder to you guys, there is no prayer, corporate prayer tonight, uh, but there will be Overcomers Outreach here at 5 o'clock, all right? Uh, so just a reminder, no corporate prayer tonight. Hallelujah. Well, let's pray and get you guys out of here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for such a wonderful and an amazing day, Lord, for this great opportunity to sit here, Lord, under your word to learn from you, Father. And as we go forth and do it now, Father, we thank you for your wisdom, your boldness, Father God, and your grace. We thank you, angels, to surround and protect us for travel mercies as we go about our way and bring us all back here safe and sound Wednesday night. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, you guys are dismissed. Go share the love of God with somebody.